Where's everybody? Good morning, church. How's everybody doing? There we go. Will you all please stand with us? We're going to sing Death Was Arrested. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin. Lost without hope and no place to be gone. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested, my life began. And ash was redeemed, only beauty remained. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. That's when death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace. And oh, your grace, so free, washes over. my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom, he faithfully bore. Then he canceled my debt and he called me his friend. Oh, that's when death was arrested in my life. Washes over me. You have made me new. Now life begins with you. And it's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new. Now life begins with you. Our Savior displayed on a criminal's cross And darkness rejoices though heaven had lost But then Jesus arose But then Jesus arose with our freedom in him And that's when death was arrested in my life began do your grace so free washes over me you have made me new now life begins with you and it's your Father, Lord God, we come before your holy throne, and we bow before you, and we worship you. Oh, Father, we bow before the one and only true God. And Father, we, we come and we just thank you for all that you've done for us. And Father, as we worship you, your name is Hallowed. Father, you, you are holy. 
And Father, you've seen our greatest need, the need for, for the forgiveness of sin. And, and to accomplish that, you sent your only Son to die on a cross that his blood might be our atonement, our covering. Father, we're thankful for, for a Father that we can come and bow before you and, and, and we can just praise your name and we can make our requests, petitions known to you. But Father, we are thankful because we are called the children of God. And Father, we rejoice in that. And Father, with all that is going on inside this world, let us not forget that we are your children. And Father, we come before you and we bow before you and we worship you. Father, I ask that you will move today and that your, your holy name would be proclaimed, that your ways and your teachings would be presented in a way that would change people's lives. And Father, I ask that you will move. May your Holy Spirit move freely inside this place. And that whenever we leave this place, that we have been touched by a holy God and that we are different than we were when we came in. And we ask this in the name of our Lord, our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. You may be seated. God is good. And all the time. Amen, amen. All right. Just so you know, I know some of y'all might have came hoping to hear Brother David ring. He's not going to be here. Uh, I'm sad. Uh, he is truly a hero of faith. But last, yesterday, uh, he sent me a text and said, Josh, I'm extremely sick and I am not going to be able to make it. And so we'll look at rescheduling him. If you came uh, to hear him preach, well, you're going to have to put up with me again. Amen? Y'all could have said that a little bit louder. It would have been a-okay with me. But do be praying for uh, Brother David uh, uh, for his recovery. I, I don't know what type of sickness it is. Several people have asked. I don't know. He just said he's uh, extremely sick. Uh, all right. How many shoe boxes are we sitting out? 1,200. Boy, y'all were weak on that, too. Y'all need to liven up. Y'all cheered too hard in that Razorback game yesterday or something. Y'all need to get a lot. How many shoe boxes are we sending out? 1,200 shoe boxes. Now, we do have the individual shoe boxes that you can buy as well, so that our number will go above 1,200. A few weeks ago, we ran out. We only had 50. We ran out. We've got more back there, so if you did not get one and you would like to take your family, your kids, your grandkids shopping for a child, pick up one of those shoe boxes back there and just go fill it up. Uh, there's instructions inside, inside of it. However, we do need it back next week. So next week is the Sunday we need all of those filled shoe boxes back. So if you've got one and you want to bring it, bring it next week. Uh, also, November the 13th is our packing party. Write that date down. We're going to have a packing party on November 13th uh, as we send out our 1,200 shoe boxes. Last week, we also highlighted our local shoe box ministry, and we did the bundles, blessing bundles. Uh, and we've got about 15 of them left. If you did not ha get one last week and you want to have one that you can just carry with you in your automobile and then just give it out to whoever you think needs it uh, as, you, as you're traveling, just carry one with you. And we've got some more back there. Just please pick those up. Uh, all right. Any kids that are here with us today that would like to go to Children's Church, if you go right up here, Mr. Wayne is waiting for you. And so all the kids that would like to go to Children's Church, you all are dismissed uh, to go to Children's Church. And if you're a guest with us in the chair pocket in front of you is a card that looks something like this. If you would fill this out and drop it in the offering plate whenever you leave. The offering plate's in the back. Uh, and you can just take that and drop it in the back. We would just like a record of your attendance uh, so that we can just thank you for being here with us today. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it back over to Brother Seth. Y'all please stand with us.
Bursting forth, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, sin's curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he. the solid rock I stand all on the ground is sinking sand all of the ground is sinking sand and on Christ the solid rock I stand all on the ground is sinking sand all of the ground is sinking sand No guilt in life No fear in death This is the power of Christ in me From life's first cry To final breath Jesus commands my destiny No power of hell No scheme of
come with trumpet sound Oh may I then in him be found Dressed in his righteousness alone Faultless and before the throne Faultless and before the throne Sing it, Christ alone Is Christ alone His cornerstone His weak and made strong In the Savior's love Y'all may be seated. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. So this song is about offering your heart up to God. And this verse is perfect for it. Um, And if you're seeking God, and you're wanting to worship him. Worship's not just music. If you're wanting to worship and actually study God's word, then your heart has to be ready. You have to offer your heart to God because a lot of, a lot of the times my heart's not ready. You know, I had to sit down, I have to pray, and there's a lot of stuff that get in the way. And so we'll sing the song about offering our heart to God, and it's just really special. So let's sing it. So what can I say? What can I do? But offer this heart, oh God, completely to you. You stood before. and 
Please take a moment and bow your head and just pray this morning that the Holy Spirit just speaks through Josh as he gives us the word. God is good, and all the time, amen. I, um, I'll i just tell you that I, I, I'm, like maybe some of y'all, I'm disappointed that Brother David's not here, but I've also thought this too. I'll just tell you, there might have been somebody, even if it's just one person that need to hear the message that I'm going to preach today, and so it might be, in fact, I would anticipate this was a divine appointment for you to be here on this date when we thought we were going to have a guest speaker. Amen? Amen? So I say that to say open up your heart that we might hear from God today. We've been teaching through and preaching through Matthew chapter 24. And Matthew chapter 24 is oftentimes looked at a, a passage and a chapter that is talking about uh, the future coming of Christ. And as we've preached through and taught through that, uh, we, we've kind of analyzed it from two different events. One, uh, what happened in 70 AD and the importance of 70 AD and, and how that really relates to Matthew 24, but that could also be a foreshadowing of what is to come uh, for us. Let me tell you something. I truly believe that Jesus Christ is coming back. Amen? Amen. I also believe that he could come back any time. Amen? Amen? And last week we read that only God knows. The time and the hour. Folks, if God knows the time and the hour, it could be close. Amen? When I look around about all that's going on, I, 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 I'm thankful for the long-suffering of God. But at the same time, it makes me just wonder, how long can this continue? The rebellion against a holy God with his creation. Now remember last week's message, I said that it was almost like we're on a trip, uh, and uh, as you're going on this trip and you have no idea how long it's going to end, and by the way, uh, again, if anybody remembers, how long would my dad say it would be? Four more miles, four more miles, that's all we got. Uh, and last week, whenever we looked at that text, he told us to do two specific things, and he said to be what, for us to watch and to be ready. Folks, if you believe that Jesus Christ could return at any moment, then we are called to watch and be ready. Folks, if you believe that Jesus Christ could come back at any moment, and I do, then I need to watch and be ready. And by the way, part of that means that I need to be telling other people about what Jesus Christ has done for us. You know what he did? Folks, he loved you so much that Jesus Christ went and died on a cross for you. That your sins, the blood of Jesus would wash the sins away. In fact, Scripture says that they are as far as the east is from the west. Folks, if you truly believe that Jesus Christ could return at any moment, then you need to be telling people about what Jesus Christ has done for you. Amen? Folks, we have to. We have to. He tells us to watch and be ready. And folks, 
being ready is going to continue in the message that I have for today. As we're going to pick up our text where we left off last week, uh, we're going to read this week, Matthew chapter 24, verses 45 through 51. So Matthew chapter 24, verses 45 through 51, out of reverence for God's word, will you please rise as we read his word, Matthew 24, verse number 45. Who then is faithful and wise servant, whom his master made him ruler over the household, and gave them food in due season? Blessed is that, is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find him so doing. Assuredly, I say to you, that he will make him ruler over all of his goods. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delayed in his coming and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of the servant will come on a day when he is not looking, when he's not looking for him in an hour when he is not aware and will cut him into two and appoint his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Father, Lord God, the time has come for the preaching of your word. And Father, today I pray that your Holy Spirit, the one that your word teaches us, dwells with inside your believers, that your Holy Spirit, Father, would control my heart, my mind, and my tongue. Oh, Father, I pray that this message is directed of you and not of me. Oh, Father, and I don't say that out of reputation, just repeating it. I say it, Father, because my heart's desire is that this message truly is directed of you. And, Father, I pray that that same Holy Spirit moves on people's lives here today and that it would touch, touch even just one life. And, Father, if there's anyone here today that does not know you as Lord and Savior, may today be the day of their salvation. Father, as you move amongst us, may we open up our hearts to listen and to heed the words that you have for us. And we will give you all the praise and honor and glory for it. And we ask this in the name of our Lord, our Savior, Jesus, and the Christ. Amen. You may be seated. I was thinking this week about, uh, and as I specifically started preparing for this message, about heroes of the faith. And some of the heroes of the faith that I have, in fact, I I remember referencing Brother David Ring that he is one of the heroes of the faith to me. And why is he a hero of the faith? Because I have watched his life through all these years and as somebody who just consistently preaches uh, Christ and Christ crucified. And he's been, to me, a faithful servant. And so I referred to him in that way. I think about people in our own church, too, that, that I consider heroes of the faith. Folks, there are people that do things around our church that I'm just so thankful for the the work and the service that they put in. I'm I'm not going to highlight all of them, but I'm just going to point out one, if y'all don't mind, and I know this person's really going to be mad at me, uh, but that's A-OK. Folks, there is, did you know that there are people that do the simplest, most important things around here? Every week I stand up here and I say, hey, in the chair pocket in front of you is a card that looks something like this, right? And every week I tell people to take those out and I tell them to put them back there. Did you know that there is somebody that just on their own goes and gets those little uh, things and they go fill them in wherever people pull them up at. You see, a hero of the faith, to me, is somebody that just wants to serve wherever, they, wherever service is needed at. Amen? Are y'all following what I'm saying? These heroes of the faith. I think of heroes of the faith that have impacted my life, and it's everyone from both my mom and my dad to both my Bobs as well, Bob Billingsley and Bob Myers. Folks, we got an amazing group of deacons here that I love. I love our elders. But I was thinking about some of the heroes of the faith in God's Word. Can you imagine what the life of Moses was like? I mean, to be raised by, by the Pharaoh and then go from living in all that wealth and comfort to all of a sudden... 
40 years you're spent out you know, just kind of herding sheep, and then 40 years after that, you're out in this wilderness in this desert area leading a bunch of grumbling people all the time. I mean, Moses, to me, was a hero of the faith because it seems like he was just one that was just so consistent and faithful. Then you got Joseph and all the ups and downs in Joseph's life as well. Joseph, to me, when I read God's Word, is a hero of the faith. I love the, the, the writer, or John, the apostle, the apostle John, and the way that he refers to himself as, as the one that Jesus loved. And those are all just, as I read God's Word, the heroes of the faith that I read. By the way, there's some in God's Word that we don't talk about much. For instance, Stephen, we don't talk about Stephen very often, but Stephen, to me, as a hero of the faith, we don't know a whole lot about Stephen other than as he's being stoned to death, whenever he's being stoned to death, do y'all know what he said as he was being stoned to death? Father, don't hold this against them. Father, forgive them. Don't hold this against them, what they're doing to me. You see, I also, somebody named Ananias. Ananias is a hero of the faith to me. A hero of the faith. Ananias, uh, if you don't know who Ananias is, folks, it's a great story. It's this simple, it seems like just this simple guy that, that wants to, he's a follower of Christ. Uh, he, he's, just, he's just there doing his own thing. And all of a sudden, he receives a word from the Lord. And that word is to go witness to one person. And that one person just happened to be named Saul. And Saul was known for murdering Christians. Ananias is the one that was like, wait just a minute. Are you sure you really want me to go talk to this dude? And God says, yeah, I really want you to go talk to him. And so Ananias got up and went and talked to the guy that was murdering Christians. You talk about a hero of the faith. Amen? Because what happened there? Saul was converted and became Paul. And let me just tell you something. Paul is one of my heroes of the faith. Paul is a hero of the faith. But I'm going to tell you one of the reasons why Paul is one of my heroes of the faith that you might not even know. See if y'all can catch on to my theme here about Paul. Romans chapter 1, verse number 1. As Paul begins the book of writing, book of Romans, he's right, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ. Anybody pick up on what it was? If not, here's hint number two. Philippians chapter one, verse number one. As he begins writing that book, he says, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ. Anybody picked up on why he's a hero of my faith yet? All right, you need one more hint? All right, I'll give you one more. Titus chapter one, he says, Paul, a bondservant of God. Anybody want to guess why Paul is one of my heroes of the faith? Bondservant. The way that Paul considered himself a bondservant. Folks, whenever I, whenever I think of Paul, I, I think of Paul as this just hero of the faith. But when Paul thought of himself, and as Paul talked about himself, he referred to himself not as this, this guy that had all these missionary journeys, not this guy that started all these churches. He referred to himself as a bondservant, a servant of Jesus Christ. You see, that, that word bondservant, we just certainly don't use it very often. It's, it's kind of classified as like being a prisoner, uh, but it's a prisoner on your own accord. It's like somebody has made a permanent decision or a permanent choice to be a servant of someone else. On their own, in their own mind, they have said, I'm going to become a servant of this person. And do you know what it meant to, to say that I was going to become a servant to that person? It said this, that you did away with all of your own personal needs. Paul said, I'm going to leave all of my personal ambitions and desires, and I'm going to be a servant of God. Folks, there's one of the reasons that Paul is a a hero of the faith to me is because he said, I'm going to set apart all of my personal desires and I am going to be a servant of Jesus Christ. Isn't that cool? I love that heart. But can you imagine 
if we started introducing ourselves that way to people, can you imagine walking up to someone, just walking up to Seth and saying, hello, Seth, I'm Josh Ramsey, bond servant of Jesus Christ. How, how would you like to be, start doing that to people? Introduce yourself that way. Hello, I am, fill in your name, and inter, as you introduce yourself, I'm a bond servant of Jesus Christ. What would that do to, for you and your faith? What do y'all think? Amen? Y'all want to try it? How about, y'all aren't really getting engaged with this. I can tell y'all are like, Josh, I don't know if I really want to do that. Can you imagine if you just walked up to people, that, by the way, do me a favor, don't try it at church, okay? I know there's going to be somebody going to come up to me after church and they're going to introduce themselves to me and they're going to say you're a bond servant of Jesus Christ. And I've known you for 10 years. I want you to do it to somebody you don't know. Walk up to someone, and as you're introducing yourself, hello, I'm a bond servant of Jesus Christ. You see, to me, I, I, I think that sometimes we, we don't like to go there. We don't, we don't want to push that. But can I tell you something? 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 1. If you want to go look it up, you can go look it up. But it says that we ourselves are servants of Jesus Christ. Folks, you're a servant. Of Jesus Christ and can I tell you something it's important that we get that in mind and I know I'm taking a lot of time to set this up for the text today because look at the way that we start the text now go back to our text because I've spent a lot of time setting it up look at verse number 45 who then is a faithful and wise wise what's that word who then is the faithful and wise servant Folks, I think every person in here that is a believer in Jesus Christ, you should have a desire in your heart to be a faithful and wise servant. Every born-again believer inside this place, if you've been saved by the blood of Christ, then you should have with inside yourself a desire to be known as a faithful, a faithful and wise servant. But if you're going to be a faithful and wise servant, then it will mean uh, that you are willing to set aside all your personal desires and follow him. If you sit here and you say, Josh, I'm a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, and I want to be known as a faithful and wise servant, then let me tell you, in between those two places, you're going to have to make a decision that I am willing to set, a, set aside all of my own personal desires. I'm going to set them all aside, and I am going to faithfully, faithfully become a bond servant of Jesus Christ. Amen? Are y'all following what I'm saying? Please nod your head if you are. Because here's the question. Are you going to be willing to do that? And if so, what does it look like? Folks, I'm going to give you some scriptures about what it looks like to be a faithful, a faithful and wise servant. Y'all want to know what it means to be a faithful and wise servant? I'm going to give you some scriptures. We're not going to turn to them all because we have too many of them. But one of them is John chapter 15, verse number 12. John chapter 15, 12 says this. This is my commandment, that you love one another. Is that what it says? That you love one another? Say that a little bit louder, Brother Bob. As I have loved you. You want to be a faithful and wise servant? John chapter 15, verse number 12. It says, then you are to love others. It doesn't stop there. It says, as I have loved you. In other words, we are to love each other the same way that Jesus Christ loved us. If you want to be a bond servant of Jesus Christ, if you want to do away with your own personal desires, and you want to be that faithful and wise servant, then folks, let me tell you something. It starts with loving other people the way that Jesus Christ loved you. How did he love you? He gave everything for you. Are you willing to do that for other people? You see, whenever I think about my hero of faith, Paul, he was willing to give up everything. 
What else does it look like? 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 15. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 15, it says this, that you're going to study to show thyself approved, the workman not ashamed uh, of the gospel of Christ. You know what that tells me? Folks, you want to be a faithful, a faithful and wise servant? Folks, you must study this book. Thank you, Brother Jan. I was going to hold my Bible up until somebody finally said amen. You have got to be a faithful student of this book. Can I tell you something? You will never learn enough from what is inside this book. You can never, even if you memorize it the same way that we saw Brother Bruce stand up here with the, his memorized chapter last week. Folks, you can memorize this whole thing, and I'm going to tell you, you still won't know, know it well enough. It's an amazing book. And we are called to study it. And let me tell you something about studying God's Word. Folks, you study God's Word, you have to open this book much more than just on Sunday morning. Amen? You need to, you need to be reading this book, I will tell you, a minimum of daily. And when I say a minimum, I think it's good to read it two or three times a day. Can I tell you something else? And I've said it before. Folks, there's a big difference between reading it and studying it. That word says study. When I study scripture, and y'all have heard the way that I preach, folks, I have to read it and read it, meditate on it, think about it. I can't read full chapters at a time. I, I do read full chapters at a time to get the context of what's being said. But I have to break down chapters, then it goes into verses, and then it goes into phrases, and then it gets down to a specific word. You see, study takes time. It takes diligence. I'm afraid that, that there's too many people today that think that, that, that they are doing really good whenever they put on a, a CD or they hook up their app somehow and it plays a reading of God's word to them and they think that they've done something really good. Let me tell you something. That's not what it told us to do. It said to study God's word. You want to be a faithful and wise servant? Folks, let me tell you something. You better carve out time inside your schedule because your schedule is not any more busier than my schedule or anyone else's. Carve out time in your schedule to study God's Word. Thank you. Amen? I don't want to have to ask you all to say that. You want to be a faithful and wise servant? Love people the way that Jesus loved you. You want to be a faithful and wise servant? Then you need to study God's word. You want to be a faithful and wise servant? Then 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse number 17 tells you to be a pray, to pray without ceasing. Folks, you want to be a faithful and wise servant, wise servant? Then you need to be a prayer warrior. And we've got some great prayer warriors here. I love it whenever some of the prayer warriors come up to me and they say, Josh, I've been praying for you. Folks, can I tell you something? Prayer is not a drudgery. Did you know that prayer should be you talking to your best friend? Don't tell me it's hard to pray. If you love Jesus Christ with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, you want to talk to him. Why? Because he is your best friend. Amen? It's not hard. You love him. He loves you. You talk to him. That's what prayer is. There's people that say, oh, I just don't know what to say whenever I pray. How do you talk to your spouse? How do you talk to your children? Why do you talk to them? Because you love them. It's the same thing. What else does it look like? I'll tell you what I should do is bring uh, Brother Bruce back up here and let him quote Romans chapter 12 again. What does it look like to be a faithful and wise servant? Everything we studied, everything we memorized in Romans chapter 12. That's a faithful and wise servant. People that love without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Repay no one evil for evil. Not being wise in your own opinion. Folks, all of those are ways that we can, we can go about being that faithful and wise servant. But if you'll do me a favor, flip just one, one page over probably in Matthew chapter 5. You want to be a faithful and wise servant? Look at what verse number 34 says. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of the Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you by the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Folks, you want to be a faithful and wise servant? then I will tell you, it means that you are going to serve the needs of other people. 
Amen. The needs of other people. And guess what? That does not take a church program for us to do that. If you see somebody in need, you help them. And you're like, Josh, why are you talking about this? Folks, go back to our text. Matthew 24, verse 45. Who then is the faithful and wise servant? Look at verse number 46. Blessed is the servant who when his master comes will find him doing. You see, you see to me this passage right here, there's a, there's a transition that has taken place inside of what Jesus is talking about. Or at least he wants to emphasize the point that we don't need to get so tied up talking about when he's going to come we need to be ready for it we need to be watching for it we need to be preparing for it but that should not stop us in doing the work of the kingdom in fact to me he also gives us a very strict warning inside this inside this text he gives us an extremely strict warning because he says look at verse number 47 assuredly i say to you that he will make him a ruler over his goods and so Jesus says, hey, listen, God is going, it's like God, Jesus came to earth and, and he walked here on earth and he showed us how we should live. And then he gave us his word to teach us how he should live. And then he gave us his spirit to lead us to that truth to show us how we should live. And now we are to live it out. Are y'all following that? It's pretty simple, right? And then he says this, I'm going to give it over to you. I'm going to see how you do. Then look at verse number 48. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming. You see, verse number 48, whenever I said there seems to be a transition or a point that Jesus is trying to make, he wants to point something out here, starting in verse number 48. Jesus says it, Jesus says right here that if he starts thinking that the master is delaying, in other words, you start thinking that none of this matters. None of this matters. Can I tell y'all something? I've told y'all before that Jesus could return tomorrow. Amen? I remember whenever I was a little kid, uh, I'd be at the house, me and, me and my brothers and sisters, and we'd be at home, and mom and dad weren't there. And about the time we thought that they would get home, what did we all do? We started running around cleaning the house, right? Y'all know, I mean, it was cleaning time. And we knew, uh-oh, it's about time for mom and dad to be home, and so we better get the house cleaned up because the house isn't clean. And so we would race around there whenever it became cleaning time. It was always very frustrating to me whenever we cleaned, and then they were like three or four hours before they actually got home. <laughs> but can I tell you all something? Verse number 48 there tells me that we should be living as if it's cleaning time. They could be, could be coming at any time. So we should be living as though it's cleaning time. Where we got the house straightened and the, and the clothes are folded, the dishes are done, and the house is clean. Why? Because mom and dad are going to be home. You see, dad could be coming home at any moment. Then he goes on and says, there in verse number 48, and then he starts talking about this evil servant. And this evil servant says, well, they've delayed their coming, so they're going to go ahead and let their house be dirty, basically, in that image that I've painted in your mind. You're going to let that house be dirty. Verse number 49, he says, and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards. You see, the evil servant says, hey, I don't think that Jesus is going to come home, and I'm going to get to start living my life the way that I want to. In fact, I will tell you, it says right there at the very beginning of it, that he starts to beat the other servants. Folks, can I tell you all something? To me, whenever I read that and I started thinking about it and pondering it and thinking about what it was meaning, that told me that it was other servants. In other words, 
It was an attack at other people inside the church. Whenever you leave this place, you decide that you're going to talk about all the negative that, that you see going on. The negativeness. I can't believe that he sits up there and every week he makes us say amen over and over. I know y'all talk about it. <laughs> amen. <laughs> <laughs> and you start talking about all the negative and this person won't ever help in the nursery and you start having these, these pity parties and, the, and you let these little, these little petty issues start bothering and you start attacking people inside the church see whenever it says that, that they were beating the other servants folks we don't beat people like in the face anymore amen I'm glad we don't but don't we beat people with our tongues? Don't we pe beat people with our thoughts? You see, whenever we sit here and, and, and we come to church and, 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 you, and you go through this and, and, and all you leave and, and you're not closer to God. In fact, you almost feel more angry because, because you leave here and somebody has made you mad. And you've spent the entire time beating people. Jesus says here, if the master returns and he found you beating your fellow servants, beating up people inside the church, can I tell you all something? Folks, we're all on the same side. If you're a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, then we're on the same side. Amen? Amen. And, and can I tell you something? I think that about other denominations, too. If they're preaching Christ crucified, I want them to see great revivals inside their church. Amen? We don't need to, we don't need to let these petty issues stop the work of the kingdom of God. See, people are either lost or they're saved. If they're saved, then they're on your team. You better get along with them. Why? Because you're going to spend eternity with them. Amen? If they're lost, you better figure out a way to get them on your team so that they're saved because you don't want to see anybody go to hell. Amen? Amen? So regardless, there's no need to be beating people up with your tongue. Next thing that he says after, after that, he says they will eat and drink with the drunk drunkards. Now, I've got two thoughts on that. The first one is this. That you think that it's okay for you to come into church and you'll hang out with your church people, but you also have all these times that you hang out with your lost friends. And you really like your lost friends much better than you do your church friends. And so it's almost like you have these two separate lives. And, 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 you, and you think that you've got this all separated so that I can hang out with my church friends on Sunday morning. But boy, I'd much rather be with my lost friends. And this is where your heart is, is over here with the lost friends. Folks, let me tell you, I think that Jesus is giving you a warning about, about you better not be one of those people that put on a faith on, face on Sunday morning. But then inside your heart and the way you act, it's completely different. See, I think that whenever he refers this, I think this, this whole thought of people that try to live two separate lives, one for the church people and one for the lost people. Folks, I've heard it. In fact, this broke, it breaks my heart. I remember attending a funeral one time of a guy that I thought was an extremely godly man. And then to hear some of his friends talk about the jokes he would tell, it shocked I was like, that's not the guy I knew. Only to find out that he must have been living two different types of lives. The life that I saw at church and the life that his lost friends saw. You see, whenever Jesus says right here that they will eat and drink with the drunkards, I think, that's, I think that he's talking about these people that are trying to live two different set types of lives. But my other thought is this. Folks, it's not about eating and drinking. My other thought is this. It's about sin. He uses eating and drinking there, but he says, hey, these evil servants are the ones that act like they're saved and they're not. They're trapped in sin, in sin. They don't really love Jesus with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. They don't know if Jesus is coming anytime soon, nor do they really care. They really love their sin, and they're going to continue in it. See, I don't think that this scripture right here is specifically just talking about the one thing of eating or drinking with the drunkards. 
I think this right here is saying there are people that are still living in sin. And can I tell you all something, folks? Let me, let me be very, very clear on this. I do believe that the teaching of once saved, always saved does a lot of damage right here. Hear me out. I believe that this whole coined phrase of once saved, always saved does a lot of damage in this fact that people say, I can absolutely stay living in sin and I'm going to get to heaven anyway. Can I tell you something? Folks, that is the furthest thing from the truth inside God's word. God's word teaches that if you're a child of God, folks, you don't like sin. If, it, if you start to sin, then you fight against it, you repent of it, and he forgives you of it. I don't think that, I don't think that born again believers uh, can stay in sin for a long period of time if they're truly born again believers in Jesus Christ. I think they want out of it. Are y'all following me? Please say amen then. Do I believe once saved, always saved? Absolutely, I've studied it out. I I believe the teaching of it, but I do think that it causes harm and damage because people believe in a security that is not really there. Why? Because they've never truly been saved. Never truly been saved. And so they, they remain in their sin. And their excuse is, it doesn't matter because I'm saved anyway. And I would say, no, that's an indication that maybe you never truly were saved. In fact, let me caution you something. In fact, better yet, don't let me caution you. Let's let God's word caution you. If, if that is where you have been at in your life, look at what happens in verse number 50. Don't let me caution you. Let's let God's word caution you as it says, the master of the servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him, at an hour that he is not aware of. So, hey, all of a sudden, Christ is going to come. Now, it might be his return, or it might be that you drop dead, but somehow you're going to meet Jesus Christ face to face. And look what he says in verse number 51. And will cut him in two, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. Read that verse 51 again. And we'll cut him in two and appoint. We'll cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. And there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You see, I find this to be a very interesting text as Jesus is talking about his return. And when his return is going to be. And he says this phrase right here. Because to me, he actually seems to say that there's going to be a greater punishment for those people who act to be servants and they're not. He says he's going to appoint them to be hypocrites. It seems to me like he says it's going to be worse on this person than it is for others. He's going to cut them in two. Don't hear him say that about everyone. You do hear him say it about this group of people. He calls them hypocrites, fake. They pretend like they have a relationship with Jesus Christ, but they don't. Their their heart is so far from Christ. Oh, they can put on the fancy face and walk into church, and they can say all the right words. There's no power. There's There's no love. Jesus says, I'm going to cut them in two and put them with the hypocrites. And then look what it says. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Folks, what does that mean? That means that person is going to be cast into eternity in hell. That that phrase, weeping and gnashing of teeth, Folks, what that means is that person, whoever that person is, that person is going to spend an eternity in hell where where the lake of fire will burn forever to the one who is playing church, who is faking people out. The the person that was at that funeral that I went to that day, that person, if if they were not saved, that they tried to fake so many people out, yet they weren't saved. Folks, it tells me that person will spend an eternity in the lake of fire.
see whenever I read this text right here. I see there are two different names. Folks, there's two names. Y'all see those two names inside the text? There's the faithful and wise servant, and there's the evil servant. The faithful and wise servant, I described to you what that would look like. Here's a question. I described what the faithful and wise servant looked like. Did that describe you? I walked through and spent all that time showing you what a faithful and wise servant would look like. Does that describe you? Are you in that category? Because if you're not in the faithful and wise servant category, then are you in the evil servant? Folks, if you're in the evil servant, and you just show up here playing church on Sunday morning, you don't walk with the Lord, have a prayer life, you don't study God's word. The warning's not from me. The caution is not from me. The caution is from God's word. He says, I'll cut you in two. I'll place you with the hypocrites. And I'll cast you into a lake of fire. Which one are you? Faithful and wise or evil? Folks, if fall into that other category, then I'm going to have a time of invitation. And folks, it's really not me having the invitation. It's God. He's inviting you to come be a child of His, to truly repent of your sin, to give your life to Christ, completely surrender everything, become a bond servant of Jesus Christ. If you're here today, you've never done that, then I would encourage you to just come down here and talk to me. Come down here. Let me show you what it means to walk with tell you what it means to truly be saved. This is an invitation. We're not going to tarry long. So if God has laid it on your heart, I would ask that you would kneel. If you will, please rise and I'll lead us in a word of prayer. Father, Lord God, I ask you'll have your way during this time of invitation. Father, that you would move on people's lives. And Father, if there's one, even just one here today that does not know you as Lord and Savior, let them realize Father, what your scripture is has cautioned them about it, warned them about it. And let them be bold enough, Father, to walk this aisle and to come and say, I want to be saved. Father, have your way. We ask this in the name of our Lord, our Savior, Jesus, we pray. Amen. May you move however God has led you as we sing. And I have decided to follow Jesus I have decided to follow Jesus I have decided to follow Jesus no turning back no turning back the world behind me the cross before me the world behind me the cross before me the world behind me the cross before me no turning back no turning back though none go with me I still will follow, though none go with me, I still will follow, though none go with me, I still will follow, no turning back, no turning back, I decided, I have decided, to follow Jesus I have decided to follow Jesus I have decided to follow Jesus no turning back no turning back the world behind me 
the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back, no turning back, though none go with me. I still will follow, though none go with me, I still will follow, though none go with me, I still will follow, no turning back, no turning back. Amen, amen. You may be seated. God is good, and all the time. Amen, amen. Folks, this has been an amazing, blessed-filled day, and here's the reason why. We'll start over here on my left. Rebecca and Scott come today, and they come uh, testifying that they know the Lord as their Lord and Savior. They've been baptized by immersion. They've been visiting, actually, since uh, Brother Alex was here. I think that was the first the week. The week before, yeah. So they thought Brother Alex was going to be here the week before, so they came to hear him, disappointed they had to listen to me. And, 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 uh, but they've come, and folks, they've been faithful servants here. I mean, uh, attending and watching, and uh, we got to visit with them the other day, but they come and they love the Lord. I will tell you something, they also don't, uh, they're not ones to just come and sit in the pew. I love their heart for getting out and standing up for truth, but they want to come and make Boundless Grace their official home, and so all who rejoice with that, raise your hand and say amen. Amen. Anybody opposed, get out. <laughs> because they're going to. Uh, but also, uh, over here, uh, Rebecca as well. We got two Rebeccas. Uh, that makes it a lot easier on me. Uh, and then Rob and their family. I don't know all their girls' names. They got five girls. We need to pray for him. Amen. <laughs> uh, can one of y'all help me with their names? Isabel, Victoria, Victoria. And Emily, Emily. Not have Madeline, Madeline and Josephine are not here, uh, and so beautiful, beautiful family, and they've uh, been attending as well, uh, they've been real busy over the summer, but they have fallen in love with our church and the people, uh, and I got to go spend some time, uh, and we went to lunch the other day, and I love to hear about their study of God's Word and their commitment uh, a study in God's Word. Folks, we have got to be in God's Word. Amen? Amen. Well, they uh, have come. They said that they now want to make Boundless Grace their official home. They uh, know Christ is Lord and Savior and been baptized by immersion. So all in favor of that, raise your hand and say amen. amen. And I'm not even giving a vote on the second way. So there you go. Amen. Um, yeah. What a, what a great, great day. I'm so thankful uh, for it. And so we, we love uh, having people join us. But, folks, my prayer is always with the families that join, that they will serve Christ through the church, but that the church will serve them. And so we need to, we need to come along beside them and help them through life's journey. We are in this together. Amen? Amen. All right. With that, uh, let's join hands with your families and then come by and greet them, welcome, welcome them to the fellowship, and let's sing Family of God as we're dismissed. And I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain and cleansed by his blood and joined heirs with Jesus as we travel this sod. For I'm part of the family, the family of God.